So uh, today we're going to have a look at uh, monetization technology trends. Uh, as Ben said, uh, we start with a very short presentation to describe the main trends uh, we are seeing in Monetize. And then we will dive into uh, an interview with uh, your space on this part of the content chain. Let's have a look at some of the main drivers of, uh, uh, of change that we're seeing in Monetize. Uh, Monetize, uh, from our perspective, is a strategic area of investment for media companies uh, as they go direct to uh, consumers and deal with the challenges of uh, online content monetization. One of the primary challenges of this is scale in revenue generation, both in advertising and uh, subscription models. Most media companies have tackled their lack of scale uh, through a collaborative approach or through acquisitions. And collaborations have focused uh, on media companies' uh, revenue sources, uh, adver uh, advertising and uh, subscriptions. Some of these initiatives have consisted of uh, partnering with or acquiring emerging technology suppliers. Uh, others have seen media companies launching joint offerings, for example, in advertising and in OTT. The industry change coupled with the rise of uh, a new emerging technology is also making data and analytics uh, increasingly important in this part of the content chain. Data is now a key asset to power advertising workflows, rights management uh, and automation, just to cite some. As I mentioned, new technologies such as programmatic uh, and uh, server-side dynamic Ad insertion remain a key focus going forward as broadcasters try to automate workflows and improve their online content monetization efforts. According to our research, adoption remains low, uh, but there is a lot of activity in uh, this area. So these are the most important drivers of uh, technology demand in monetize uh, from our research. And as you can see, the focus is on cross-platform uh, delivery. Uh, as media companies uh, look to deliver content to multiple platforms, uh, they, they want to monetize it effectively with, uh, uh, for example, cross-platform uh, ad delivery and more effective measurement uh, systems. The second most important trend relates to automation followed by uh, virtualization. But now let me uh, introduce our guest today. Uh, today you are joined by uh, Tim Sewell, uh, CEO at Yourspace. Thank you very much, Tim, for being with us today. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to take part. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Tim, uh, I wanted to start with a very general question I was I usually do in these webinars. Uh, what, are your, from, what are, from your perspective, the main drivers of change in this part of the content chain in, uh, in Monetize? Um, okay, I guess for positioning, I should say, obviously, our, our view on this is coming specifically from um, the OTT space, although that's the OTT space working with uh, broadcasters. Um, so uh, I guess, firstly, um, there is a real focus on, as, as you'd expect, on um, delivering addressable TV and specifically addressable TV uh, across the widest possible range of platforms. And when I, when I talk about addressable TV, I'm not necessarily talking about linear delivery or, or satellite yeah. delivery. It's delivery to the, um, to the large screen. So increasingly the focus with the broadcasters we're working with is enabling um, personalization um, and addressable TV for advertisers to the large screen through OTT delivery. Yeah. So, yeah, you were saying? Yeah, and, and, and obviously as part of that, it's about ensuring that you're delivering a true TV experience to that audience, whether it's on demand content or live content. So you know, consumers today expect a TV quality experience if they're viewing on a big screen, regardless of the underlying technologies that are making that possible. So there's a significant focus on, on sort of quality of service. And whilst obviously advertising revenues are important, yeah. you know, probably the number one priority is ensuring you know, delivering you know, a true TV experience on those platforms. Okay, great. Thanks, Sim. Um, as I mentioned before um, about scale, uh, some broadcasters have launched uh, joint advertising initiatives, uh, for example, the uh, European Broadcast Exchange to increase uh, the scale of their audiences. This is similar to what is happening in OTT, for example. Uh, do you see this trend continuing in the next years? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think it, it probably has to because the broadcasters need to achieve 
um, sufficient scale to be interesting for the advertisers, given you know their, their main competition is not the other broadcasters, it's yeah. you know the big internet giants. Um, so you know collaboration in terms of ability uh, to both buy inventory but also technology collaborations, I suspect. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, and it's interesting this is happening uh, a little bit more in Europe as well, because uh, so far it's happened uh, mostly in the US, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, there's, you know, there's been a number of announcements recently, um, you know, the, the collaboration between ProSieben and uh, RTL, yeah. Um, yeah, media sets investment in ProSieben, the um, joint proposition between ProSieben and, uh, and Discovery in Europe. So, yeah, it really seems to have accelerated in the last, um, in the last six months or so, I'd say. Yeah, no, great, thanks, Tim. Uh, talking about OTT, most of the successful uh, models remain uh, subscription-based, uh, uh, as shown by most of the initiatives uh, and also by some of the trends in the publishing industry. Uh, what, in your opinion, is preventing AVOD to take off? Um, well, I guess it's, it's, it's all relative, really. I mean, the, the, the broadcasters' AVOD services, I would say, are... Uh, you know, are successful and have taken off, but you're comparing those with the scale of of, uh, you know, of Netflix or Amazon. Yeah. Um, uh, if you look in the US, obviously the Hulu model, a, a significant proportion of their revenues come from the ad supported subscription model they have. So I think we'll see more of those sort of hybrid models. Um, and obviously through some of the collaborations we're seeing where um, you know, the, the reach in terms of the, the, the breadth of content available increases, um, I think that will also drive um, you know, further adoption of, of, of AVOD. It, it, interestingly, in the Nordics, where um, there has perhaps been a more aggressive shift from terrestrial traditional TV to OTT consumption, um, I think uh, you know, a number of the broadcasters in, in the Nordic markets have been um, far more uh, progressive and, and have more uh, proactively sought partnerships with the pay TV platforms and, and other delivery platforms to get their content out to the widest possible audience. Um, so, you know, from, from our experience, the Nordics is something of a blueprint of what we hope is going to happen in other, other parts of Europe um, in the coming year. Very interesting. So you think that uh, um, it's, if OTT becomes more established in a certain geography, um, the development of uh, um, online, the AVOD and online advertising uh, is a consequence of that. I think so, yes, because yeah. what it enables for the broadcasters is the ability to deliver the same sort of addressability that platforms like yeah. as AdSmart solution deliver, but potentially at a fraction of the cost. So yeah. uh, that, you know, it allows traditional broadcasters to compete in ways that weren't perhaps previously possible. Um, and then when you tie that in with collaboration with, as I say, the, the, the telcos and the um, broadband providers, um, that's one of the ways that the broadcasters can start, start to offer you know, greater scale to advertisers. Okay, okay, great. Uh, let's move on to programmatic now. Uh, from our data, this trend remains at a very early stage in the broadcast and media industry. What are, you, in your opinion, uh, the challenges preventing broadcasters from moving to programmatic workflows? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the picture is, um, is a little bit varied by market. So what we observe is in yep. um, the US and Australia, for example, um, programmatic is used um, fairly heavily uh, in broadcaster OTT delivery. Um, so it's a significant proportion there, where in some other markets, um, there is little or no uh, reliance on programmatic. I think um, one of the challenges with programmatic and broadcast is obviously one of the big strengths of broadcast is um, the um, quality of the inventory and the brand safe inventory. And yeah. part of that is due to all of the compliance that's in place for broadcast, which includes you know, things like um, chain of custody for ad copy and you know, um, ad approval before um, ads are put in flight on, on broadcast content. So a lot of the processes and systems that have been put in place for broadcast TV for you know, you know, 20, 30 years um, are not yet fully supported in the programmatic um, ecosystem. Um, so that has meant that um, some broadcasters have been cautious to, you know, fully embrace programmatic until some of those, um, some of those issues are resolved. Um, and then in, in the case of OTT, there are also specific challenges around enabling programmatic on live TV, where 
you have the sort of conflicting requirements of delivering a live stream seamlessly without any buffering to the end user and the need to allow a real time auction to complete um, to you know allow programmatic trading to take place. Um, so we're seeing sort of quite a lot of innovation coming through around optimizing programmatic for live, both in terms of things like competitive separation and and um, uh, price optimization, but also just in terms of ensuring that you can successfully complete um, you know, the programmatic uh, hops in time to completely fill a linear TV break on OTT. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Very complex industry as well. And programmatic is, of course, powered by data. And recently, the founder of Publicis uh, has said that uh, the advertising industry is now ruled by math men rather than mad men about data. Uh, some broadcasters have started experimenting with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in advertising to drive more personalization and intelligence, automation, for example. Do you see any potential for this to become a more established trend? Um, I think it, it's um, obviously those are very broad terms that, that cover a lot of yeah. technologies. I think um, yeah. in terms of um, improving um, you know, contextual um, decisionings, yeah. you know, um, programming to advertising, then there are opportunities there. I suppose one, one of the challenges is the further you push down the personalization path, um, the bigger the issue of scale can become. So there's kind of this balance. You need to achieve scale um, so that you're still delivering a size of audience that's of interest to the advertisers. So I think there's, there's certainly a lot that can be done in terms of um, using um, uh, AI and machine learning to identify ad opportunities in content and potentially to provide additional parameters to the ad server so that the advertising is more contextually relevant to the program that was being viewed. But whether that pushes through to genuine personalization to the individual, I think you know, there are obviously a number of issues around that level of personalization, one of which is the scale that you achieve. Uh, and, and then the other is also whether, whether the... Um, perception of the viewer is that uh, you know that that level of relevance has perhaps become a little creepy for want of a better term okay so, <laughs> there is a balance in terms of technically what's possible whether you can do that and still deliver the scale of audience and also whether it's entirely appropriate from from the audience's perspective yeah that, that's that's very interesting so a trade-off between targeting and scale also because the uh, the algorithms uh, need a lot of data to produce accurate results as well don't they Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, another technology heavily relying on data is, uh, um, and we, I mentioned it before, uh, server-side uh, dynamic ad insertion. And of course, you have a special interest in this. Uh, are you seeing an, an increasing adoption of this technology at broadcast media organizations at the moment? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it's been um, in the UK, which is obviously our, yeah. our market, all of the um, major um, UK broadcasters have been, uh, you know, have embraced um, server-side ad insertion really since early 2015. So in, in the UK market, it's pretty well established and, um, um, you know, is, is seen as standard for live. Uh, less so for video on demand content, but we expect okay. that change over time because it delivers you know, a, a superior um, user experience. In other markets, um, you know, in some markets, the uh, regulatory environment has been a little slow to change, which has, um, has perhaps slowed adoption. So there are some markets which um, perhaps haven't embraced the technology as um, rapidly as, as markets like the US and the UK. But pretty much across the board, what we're seeing this year is that um, there are you know, major initiatives in, in all of the major markets to look at adopting um, uh, server-side ad insertion as a, as a technology for both live and increasingly for video on demand. Um, and as I say, if you look at the Nordics, they're probably one of the most advanced in terms of the breadth of forms that are being reached. Uh, interesting. And what in the markets where uh, they've not adopted it uh, uh, yet, um, to a great extent, uh, um, what kind of uh, regulatory challenge have broadcasters encountered? Um, in some cases, it's um, you know, whether you are allowed to deliver um, targeted um, um, okay. broadcaster. So there are certain okay. um, restrictions to protect um, local media outlets, which yeah. limit exactly what the broadcasters can do. 
uh, as I say, those those restrictions are, are typically you know falling away now. Um, but obviously, um, that has sort of the pace of adoption in some markets. Okay, great, thanks, Tim. And you, you talked about compliance before. Uh, uh, how do you see in your privacy legislation, such as GDPR, impacting uh, uh, the advertising industry and advertising technology development at companies like, like yours? Uh, yes, so I mean, it, obviously, um, the last um, 18 months, two years, there's been a significant focus in, you know, from all aspects of the delivery chain to ensure GDPR compliance. Yeah. So that, was, that was phase one. Um, and, you know, there is an ongoing focus on ensuring that, um, particularly when programmatic is in the mix, to ensure that um, broadcasters are only passing the appropriate data um, out for ad decisioning. So one of the advantages of server-side ad insertion is it does act as a um, layer of protection between both the broadcaster's systems, the end users, players, and the broadcaster's data, because the broadcaster has complete control of what yeah. information is used for decisioning. So you know, one of the byproducts of GDPR is it's, it's another driver for why server-side ad insertion is being adopted, because it prevents potentially unknown third parties from, um, you know, having access to the end user's device or player. And, and you know, it, it, it prevents cookies being set and various other things. So there's a lot of advantages for the broadcasters in adopting SSAI in terms of ensuring they may, you know, they retain complete control of um, what data is being made available. Okay, okay, great, thanks, Tim. Uh, what about ad blocking, which has been considered always a challenge for uh, online advertising as well? Is this still a significant challenge that the industry needs to address from your perspective? Um, I mean, for, from, from the broader perspective of online advertising, I, I would say yes, in, in the context of the broadcast sector, who, who are our, yeah. our partners, um, it is less of an issue for the broadcasters because okay. a lot of the consumption is, you know, is typically in full screen on connected devices. Um, desktop is is that a very relevant platform, but not the biggest platform for consumption these days. And obviously, if you um, if you start blocking server side ad insertion, um, you're preventing yourselves from watching the content as well. So for for broadcasters, I think it's less of an issue. Okay. Um, server side ad insertion is a mechanism for trying to combat ad blockers, yeah. but obviously, simply being able to play the ad does not mean that the impressions are being recorded and so you know the um ad impressions are being monetized so you, know, you would need a combination of server-side ad insertion and perhaps um you know proxying of um, impression pixels to ensure that you're able to accurately measure um, um all views of ads um, but as i said i think it's it's less of an issue for the broadcasters due to the nature of their content and the delivery that they have interesting interesting and as i said before um on investment uh, monetized from our perspective is becoming um, an increasingly important uh, area of investment for broadcasters. And some of them uh, have chosen to purchase uh, uh, our technology and to bring it in house. Uh, and this technology can be programmatic or dynamic uh, ad insertion. Do you see this trend uh, continuing in the next year as well? Um, as we said with um, uh, the, collaborat the collaborative initiatives as well. Yes, I, I, I think it's uh, it's almost certain to whether that's um, investment in ad tech or, or acquisition of ad tech. I don't think it's necessarily because broadcast groups feel that they need to own their end to end stack. But I okay. think the value, um, you know, value in this sector. Um, and I also expect we'll see more collaboration where broadcasters are sharing uh, elements of the technology stack. I'm uh, sorry, technology stack. Okay, so if it's not for internalizing technology, what, what's in your opinion the main driver behind this? I think that internalizing is, is one, particularly yeah. for broadcasters in multiple territories okay. wanting to have a standard approach to yeah. how, they, um, you know, how they enable um, monetization of this type. So I think that is one of them, but I think it is, is also you know, part of their wider investment strategy and, and you know, yeah. diversifying their revenue streams. Okay, okay, great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, ben, we are we are finished. If you want to, if there are any questions, thanks, Tim. By the way, for all the great Thank insights. Uh, ben, um, we have got a question coming here. 
Uh, how do you see the adoption of blockchain in advertising? The technology is at an early stage of development, although the few initiatives launched have focused on monetization. I would suggest that's not a question for me because I would not um, claim to be an expert in blockchain in any sense. Brenzo, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, apologies. Uh, sorry, it was a little bit of a hospital pass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from, from our perspective, uh, it's, it's still at an early stage uh, of development. Uh, um, so there have just been experimentations and trial, one of the main ones in uh, the US with uh, Comcast launching this, uh, um, this initiative, BlockGraph. But most of the of the initiatives uh, have been uh, collaborative uh, initiatives as well as we said at the beginning with broadcasters coming together to explore the technology. Um, most of them are focused on monetize uh, as uh, in advertising and rights management uh, at, at least according to our research plan. And so, um, you've recently uh, published a new blockchain report haven't you Lorenzo which is yeah. on our website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay so we have there's a question here for you Tim. Um, what is Yo Space's focus after the RTL acquisition? Um, it's exactly uh, as it was before. So, you know, part of the reason that um, the acquisition by RTL was attractive to the Yo Space team was that uh, they were very clear from the outset that they wanted us to continue with our international um, rollout and expansion. Um, and so, you know, they they give us the ability to. Uh, accelerate our investment both in terms of you know product development but also um rolling out into new markets so you know your space is continuing to operate as a completely independent business clearly we have some great insights into the programmatic ecosystem because uh, right. our sister company spotex is also part of the rtl sort of ad tech group but it's really just about us continuing to focus exclusively on the media owner slash broadcast sector um, and, and just accelerate the pace of uh, rollout of the technology. Okay, thanks, Grace, Tim. And it's interesting that RTL wants to uh, partner with other broadcasters in Europe as well, isn't it? Because it's consistent with what we said before at the beginning. Yes, the absolutely. I mean, I, we, we've obviously only been part of the group for a relatively short period of time. Yeah. So. I'm not an expert on the broader strategy, but certainly, of course, on the outside, yeah, the recent announcement of their partnership with with uh, Perceven is, uh, yeah. is perhaps not something that would have been envisaged, you know, even 12 months ago. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's it's very interesting. Okay, thanks, Tim. Ben, hey, so I think that's um, all the questions that we've uh, that we've received. So, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Lorenzo and to um, especially thank Tim for joining us.